Hi, this is Matt McCormick of the Department of Philosophy at California State University, and this is my second lecture on Beaudry and Brackman's article, How Convenient the Epistemic Rationale of Self-Validating Belief Systems. Um, this is currently part of my Inductive Logic 161 course, and we're talking about um, conspiracy theories and self-validating belief systems. So uh, let me pick up and review where we left off last time. So these guys are pointing out and they're drawing on a bunch of empirical psychology literature that identifies this long list of uh, strange biases, heuristics, uh, mistakes, gaps, glitches in the human cognitive system. Confirmation bias, morbid reasoning, um, and so on. Okay, so the human belief system sort of delivered from the Paleolithic era is built to um, have a, a bunch of these proclivities, a bunch of these dispositions to do this. And what they're interested in is on the epistemological side, because that's more about the cognitive psychology, about how human brains are built. And they're interested on the belief side well, what kind of belief systems develop in the world when you've got a bunch of uh, cognitive agents, a bunch of primates, with these um, tendencies, with these proclivities? Well, what we find then is that one of the things that happens is that a bunch of weird belief systems develop, and the, a particular uh, variety or flavor or shape of weird belief system will develop in the face of... Uh, a bunch of uh, believer agents that have those features, uh, there will be these these systems that develop that have things they call multiple endpoints. They're the product of vague predictions. Uh, they employ what they call moving targets in the uh, belief system, the ideology, and I'm going to explain what these are in just a minute. They uh, employ post-diction of invisible causes and conspiracy thinking, discrediting of skeptical stances, they employ invisible escape clauses. Uh, they avoid disproving circumstances. So the idea is that on the it's like you've got a host and you've got a virus, except in this case it's a cognitive agent on one side, and it's not a virus. It's a it's a belief system. And certain belief systems, um, you know, we could talk about like I've been using religious examples. You know, you could talk about the details about, say, Hinduism versus Judaism versus Islam versus uh, Christianity, and there's always, obviously, different stipulated claims that are true within those systems, but they're looking at epistemic features of the whole systems. Um, and weird belief systems, as they describe them, are ones that will often employ some of these. And there's lots of good religious, religious examples that use these, too. Um, but we've got so many good examples in the news, um, in American political culture, just in the last few years. Um, you know, I, I originally started teaching this thing before Trump. Now, post-Trump and QAnon and all that stuff, we've got so much material that seems to illustrate and demonstrate what these guys are talking about. And, of course, faith is this big feature in um, religious uh, belief systems. Okay, so uh, let me explain this thing that uh, sort of came on the scene um, in this area of research in uh, the 80s, 80s or 90s, and it's called memetic evolution. So a meme, long before the internet, people were talking about memes as, 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 a, as an idea pattern or a self-replicating pattern of information. So um, Richard Dawkins probably is the first one to suggest this, to suggest that um, ideas or patterns of information, when they take up residence and inhabit uh, cognitive agents' heads, they, um, you know, they can act like uh, a virus. They can act like a uh, invading um, uh, uh, agent that uh, invades and takes over its host. Um, and they can also act like uh, they can also have something that resembles genetic evolution over time, where the ideas change. The features of the ideas change over time as they inhabit and suss out or explore their environment. So, you know, um, in sort of good old-fashioned biological evolution, uh, you know, over time, an or organisms um, that uh, manifest uh, gene frequencies will uh, suss out uh, not deliberately, not consciously, but over time, a natural selection will develop organisms that are that fit and have a nice, a good match to their environment, such that they survive. 
so that survival pressures will weed out some genes and survival uh, pressures will uh, propagate or encourage the presence of other genes in the population. Okay, so now if we're talking about, instead of talking about genes, we're talking about memes. So um, the environment, which is a bunch of human brains, socializing, texting, in Instagramming, Facebooking, um, a bunch of humans have got, that's the, that's the environment, instead of the African savanna, um, now it's just a bunch of human brains, and they have their ways of interacting, and these memes take up residence, and then some memes die out because they don't um, have the right kinds of features to prosper in this environment, and other memes um, develop, uh, mutate, change over time, and develop features that make them um, successful. And what does successful mean? They move on, they make it out to other other brains, and then make it to other brains, and they get bigger and stronger and faster and more uh, uh, widely dispersed and more resilient and more resistant to eradication. All right, so it started as a sort of metaphor about you know mimetic evolution is kind of a was a kind of a lark idea um, to contrast to genetic evolution, but then this whole thing took off and people said, wait a minute, this is not just a metaphor. There's really something like this going on um, out there in the world. So centuries of human culture, uh, over which millions upon millions of beliefs have been tried out and entertained. You've got all these clever monkeys out there thinking of new ideas, coming up with all, all kinds of ideas about the world, but only some of them get remembered, acquired, or transmitted. Only some have the features that give them traction and make them spread in that environment. There are constant cultural and interpersonal variations being generated, so it's inevitable that, for a variety of complex reasons, some ideas will be more successfully remembered, recalled, or propagated. Um, you know, when I was a when I was a kid, uh, my mom started taking me to a uh, a little fundamentalist Christian church, and I'll never forget that the preacher there had been um, part of, with some other people, had been part of another church there in town, and they had gotten to talking to each other. And they've been doing their sort of Bible study, and probably they had some personal rift with some of the people at the other church. And the the, the preacher for the new church, um, what he did was they they got to talking, and they packed up, and they left, and they went and made a new church. Um, they got a new building, and they brought some people with them, but then they went and found some some other people to join in with them, and then they sort of forged ahead with their own sort of doctrinal interpretation of the Bible and their own set of um, you know, religious convictions and pr religious principles. And I'll, I'll never forget that they spent a lot of time um, uh, in sermons and in lessons and the like, defining themselves against the people they had left. Oh, we're not like that. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. Here's why the Catholics are wrong. Here's why the Baptists are wrong. Here's why those people are wrong, because they didn't uh, adhere close enough to this right pattern, uh, this right set of ideas in the Bible. Okay, so there was a the humans have get, have this kind of natural tendency uh, to form schisms and dislike people and have blowouts or have uh, you know conflict and the like, um, and that can spin out. I think I assume and unfold in terms of them uh, you know pinpointing these doctrinal differences. Um, so what it, for whatever reason uh, there's a there's an environment where there's lots of new ideas being generated. And some ideas will be more successful and get more traction and take up um, space in the world, and other uh, ideas will just peter out. Um, and in fact, I was speaking to a secular humanist group in uh, San Francisco many years ago, and the guy who ran and organized the group um, started talking to me over dinner about how he doesn't like the way those secular humanist folks over there in the East Bay do things. I don't like the way they think about uh, atheism and they think about free thinking. Um, I don't agree with them at all. And I thought, wow, the atheists have the very same kind of um, schism-minded uh, orientation about, well, um, those are the bad atheists, but we're the right atheists. They've got it wrong, but we've got it right. Right, so there's this sort of you know fundamental human tribalism about people separating, and then there's these ideas that um, uh, inhabit the different tribes and uh, accentuate or or maybe exploit the differences. And I've already used this example several times. Different belief systems and belief system, uh, different beliefs and belief systems will suss out the ways to hook the human mind and propagate. 
Um, so apocalyptic death cults get weeded out, like um, Marshall Applewhite's uh, Heaven's Gate had maybe 49 followers when they all killed themselves, um, and they neutered themselves so that they couldn't have babies because they didn't believe in sex. Um, so even though that's a famous example of a, of a cult, uh, it's a tiny cult, and they flared up for just a few years and existed for a little while, and then they killed themselves out. The idea... Um, the idea, the belief system that they came up with, this idea that they're going to transcend this reality and go off to live with the UFOs um, in the, the uh, tail of the Hollybop comet, um, didn't have traction. It wasn't going to go anywhere. That wasn't going to work out. It, didn't, it wasn't going to pan out. And it's certainly not going to pan out if you um, all neuter yourself sexually and can't have kids. On the contrast, though, on contrast, though, uh, Mormons and Catholics and the like, lots of these other belief systems have advocate heavily for, directly for, you need to have lots of kids, or we need to go spread the word, right? So evangelism is a really powerful mimetic feature that if you can build that into your um, cult, into your religion, into your belief system, whatever. Um, this, if you can exploit this sort of desire to go out in, in, in humans and, and spread the word, if you can, if the if the idea can get traction to do that, then that's going to make the thing get traction over time and spread through human cultures and spread over human history. Okay, so the weird thing though is that Bowdry and Bracken say they're not meme selectionists, um, and I've puzzled over this over this for a long time because that's the way I'm portraying them. Here's what they say about that. They say, one of the constraints that channel beliefs and belief structures is the degree of structural resilience they exhibit to adverse evidence and critical arguments, accounting for the puzzling popularity of certain weird belief systems. So some weird belief systems um, have a lot of structural resilience and they just keep going. You can't stamp them out. And they are um, very good at resisting contrary evidence. Okay, so that's the first thing they say. They say about themselves, we are not offering a straightforward selectionist approach of culture, typically in terms of memes or cultogens. That's too simple, they say, and these views largely obscure the shaping role of our cognitive architecture, memes or culture culture Okay, I I don't I'm not sure about all that. I I I don't know if I fully sense the distinction between them. And Blackmore, Dawkins, Richardson, and Boyer, or Boyd, for example. Um, but I'll take a stab at it. I think maybe what they mean here is that um, human brains have got a certain particular list of of wrinkles, a certain have a certain shape to them, um, and that shape, uh, the the shape of our cognitive architecture, that affects what kinds of um, mimetic. Uh, 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 groups, what, what ideologies then can make it or not make it. I don't think that's incompatible with anything Dawkins says, but that, that's a doctrinal dispute that they're having with some other people in the literature, so I'll just leave it. Um, I'm not too worried about this so-called difference. Okay, so here's a way to now think about what we're talking about with mimetic evolution. Um, look, some evolved relationships between host and infection are symbiotic, and it helps both parties. So, like this is the clownfish with a sea anemone. You might have seen um, the Disney movie, or the Pixar movie. And in that case, both the sea anemone and the clownfish both get something from the relationship. Um, they both prosper and they both thrive as a result of their combined activity or behavior. By contrast, here's another famous example. Um, this is uh, there's a there's a bacterial infection that gets in cats, and it's called. Uh, Toxoplasmo gondii, toxoplasmosis is this thing that gets into cats. And in the biology cycle, this, um, I think it's a bacterial infection, it gets out into the environment and then um, uh, mice, it gets into the brains of mice. And this particular um, uh, uh, bacterial infection uh, makes mice less afraid of cats. It's really remarkable. Uh, it's got a lot of attention in the literature. So uh, mice who've been infected with this thing that comes from the guts of cats um, are then less afraid of cats, resulting then, of course, in the mice getting eaten um, and then sustaining the cycle. But of course, that's not good for the mice. So what we what we might legitimately ask then, is the belief system that's currently inhabiting your system, is it hijacking you? 
Um, is it to your detriment or is it to your benefit, right? And you may have had this experience where you talk to somebody who's deep in a conspiracy theory or deep in a sort of cult-like like mentality, and it seems like they're lost. It seems like you can't get to them. There's no, there's no, there's no way out for them. Their whole worldview has been hijacked by this set of ideas that's in their head. That I'd argue, at least according to some sort of modern, you know, liberal arts, liberal education principles, sort of, you know, John Stuart Mill versions of freedom. That's a case of of you know, the belief system actually uh, undermining the autonomy and the freedom and the ration, rationality of the agent. Uh, but I'll leave it up to, to you to decide some of those cases. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of these epistemic defense mechanisms that develop in these ideologies. And I got lots of sort of side examples here to, to bring up and exa examine. Um, the multiple endpoints business that they're talking about is that, um, I'll give, give some examples. Um, Revelations, the last book in the Bible, astrology, and you may have heard of this guy, um, a medieval um, sort of writer named Nostradamus. Um, they all use the thing that, that Baudry and Bat Prattman call multiple endpoints. And what it means is that the ideology or the belief system provides a specific interpretation or a range of broader metaphorical ones, and the believer gets to switch back and forth so that any outcome fulfills the, the thing they believe. Um, so I've got a couple examples from from Nostradamus here, who is said to have predicted Hitler. He's also said to have predicted the atomic bomb. And the idea is that there's vague, metaphorical, sort of poetic allusions um, or vague predictions being made in these poet poem passages from Nostradamus. And if you kind of squint your eyes or look at it from a distance, it kind of sounds like Hitler or it kind of sounds like the atomic bomb. Um, it kind of seems specific, but it's not, and you're able to kind of um, blur the lines and say, oh, he actually predicted it, right? Um, or alternatively, people talk about using moving targets. Um, so a failed prediction, for example, in an apocalyptic death cult or uh, some, you know, Christian millennialist cult or something, a failed prediction of the end of the world or the second coming of Christ gets reinterpreted as an invisible or spiritual uh, um, revolution. Um, you, know, you switch things around after the prediction fa fails and you say, oh, I had it wrong. It turns out it wasn't going to go that way. It's going to go this other way. And a really great example of this is go watch one of these documentaries about Waco and the Branch Davidians. They had a leader named David Koresh who led them into this really dark um, and, and fascinating um, sort of apocalyptic end of the world um, sort of Christian uh, fundamentalism. Uh, and they ended up having a big standoff with the government and they get they all get killed there or they kill themselves. Um, and uh, David Koresh employed a lot of these sort of multiple endpoint strategies or moving targets. And the other example I have is um, you'll see lots of modern American uh, sort of fundamentalist Christians uh, exploiting the book of Revelations. And I've got John Hagee down here who leads a church down south that's really good at this. He's got this elaborate scheme of uh, predictions about what um, Revelation says is going to happen. All these references to seven angels and seven seals and seven goats. And um, there's vague and seemingly specific predictions being made. Um, revelations and lots of religious texts provide fertile ground of metaphor, illusion, imagery, and seemingly specific claims and predictions that can be woven into a detailed prophecy by the motivated that seems uncannily accurate and profound. And boy, this comes up over and over again in history, and then it hooks people. It grabs them in and really, um, you know, uh, um, convinces them. And then any specific prediction that one of these systems makes um, that turns out to be false, well, then if you've if you're using one of these sort of um, loose, metaphorical, poetic texts, you can re-engineer the prediction um, on the fly with some more study and analysis of revelations or whatever, and then recalculate on the basis of the metaphors. If what Nostradamus says is vague enough, or if what Revelation says is sort of weird and vague or, or metaphorical enough, um, we can build these multiple interpretations, multiple endpoints, or moving targets that immunize the um, the overall belief system, like um, millennial, you know, apocalyptic Christianity. Uh, generally, uh, if it's got these features sort of built into it, um, 
you can keep the, the, the belief system, the ideology keeps rolling forward um, because it provokes and sort of coaxes these people in and gets them excited about the end of the world. And they, some of them will actually make predictions. And if it doesn't work out, then they'll, they'll move it forward and ratchet and change the change, move the goalposts, right? So you can think of multiple endpoints and moving targets as kind of uh, moving the goalpost trickery uh, that the, that develops within some belief systems that prevents them from getting disproven. And that's really at the end of the world and end of the day. That's what it's um, this is all about is uh, uh, it, we're talking about belief systems that are resilient to disproof. They're resilient or resistant to uh, skepticism or criticism or counter evidence. So you um, you get on this uh, this sur sort of surf this wave forward where you keep people excited and um, and worked up and um, intrigued. Uh, obviously about the end of the world, but you never quite sharpen it down or nail it down quite enough to um, get yourself in trouble and prove yourself wrong. Um, you get ways to sort of work that out. And then if you do, if a prediction fails, well, then you've got to work after the fact, which is ex post facto, you've got to work out some, well, there's some invisible thing that happened that we didn't know about. Causal relations and conditions aren't specified clearly, so there can never be an empirical refutation. Um, so what does that mean? What, what are we talking about here? Well, there's lots of examples. Magic rituals, shamanic powers, crystals, um, prayer. You know, one of the good examples here is, is prayer because people will say, well, I prayed for X, you know, whatever. I prayed to win the lottery, but I didn't win the lottery. So that would suggest that, my, that prayers don't work. Well, no, there's no way of understanding that. That could just suggest that God in his infinite wisdom knows that my winning the lottery is not a good thing for me. Um, and in fact, I found a $10 bill and that I think was actually God answering my prayer, um, teaching me a lesson um, that, you know, wanting, you know, longing after the lottery is the wrong thing to want. Um, but God, by his grace, you know, did this for me or did that for me or, or whatever. I'm making up that example as I go. Um, but the point is that there's a retrospective or ex post facto um, re-engineering of the story to explain for um, the observed effects that didn't pan out the way we thought they would. Um, or, you know, uh, the failure of the prediction or the magic power or, or the um, anticipated event um, wasn't uh, was because we didn't pray the right way, or I didn't have enough faith, or I didn't perform the ritual correctly, um, or there was some interference from some other invisible cause, um, or something like that, right? So after the fact, when some seeming counter evidence or contrary evidence comes up, you uh, engineer an explanation for why that's actually not disproving evidence, that actually is part of the story. That's what this post-addiction of invisible causes business is about in Beaudry and Brackman. Um, and there's another good example in an article. Uh, you might Google this. It's called The Psychopharmacology of Alternative Medicine. And one of the things that, that, that uh, uh, alternative medical therapies often use to sort of exploit our gullibility is they will say, well, we'll take some of this, you know, take some, um, uh, you know, um, some of this remedy for your cold and then if it doesn't work we'll take some more and if it doesn't work we'll take some more and what would have happened is that your cold would have gotten better anyway um, but you keep taking more and then you mistakenly attribute the uh, the bogus cure to your getting better when you would have gotten better anyway um, that's not as not as sort of distinct an example of post diction of invisible causes, um, but it's kind of a built built in mechanism that um, makes it so that the um, the 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 thing in question always seems to work. Alternative medicine always seems to work. Um, everything seems to work to its uh, uh, benefit. Okay, so let's talk about conspiracy thinking, a different kind of uh, feature that uh, develops in some of these meme complexes or in these ideologies that we find. And when you see conspiracy thinking is a, is a feature that occurs in these ideologies and then it makes them resilient to disproof. And they're very powerful, very effective ways of dealing with counter evidence. Um, and, you know, when Baudry and Brackman wrote this, they weren't they hadn't this is prior to Trump and all what we've gone through in America in the last four years but we've seen 
conspiratorial thinking sweep through um, American social culture, so much so that the craziest, outrageous views are now m part of the mainstream. We've got members of Congress who are, um, you know, spewing some of the most crazy conspiratorial thinking that used to be just confined as kind of the lunatic fringe. Um, and it, it, it's you can see how it's like a, a you know, we're also in the, in the middle of an actual pandemic where there's a virus that is sweeping across the planet. Well, uh, you know, we're, we're using the virus metaphor to talk about certain kinds of um, mimetic or idea features or part of the features of idea systems that then can make them more infectious. Look at how infectious conspiratorial thinking has become and how it is making... Um, uh, these these ideologies on the political right, especially, um, resistant to disproof, resistant to counter evidence. Um, the idea behind conspiracy think thinking is always that there are secret plans or groups that are pulling the strings, making the world look one way, and hiding their influence and the truth. Like the real truth is hidden out there, um, but we can't see it because they're obscuring it from us, and there's something sinister going on out there. Um, even my, my uncle, a really sort of, you know, sweet hearted, simple, um, um, good guy has gotten all swept into this stuff. And he's all suspicious about the government doing all these things to him and, um, and the like. Um, but it's not new. Um, what we're witnessing now is much more widespread in the United States, but it's not a new phenomena. Um, they've always used um, this approach where you eliminate errant data. You take these data points of things that are weird, things that don't... Um, uh, fit and you explain them these anomalies and you build them into the thing so people find anomalies in the moon landing they find anomalies in the kennedy assassination 9 11 sandy hook clintons and capital writers and whatever and then you build it into um oh yeah well that's just the way the thing was built or that's just the way the conspiracy works that's how they're hiding it from you um so they're so bodrum and brackman have got this discussion of errant data that explains the whole thing um and the self-validation here and the elimination of skepticism works this way. A lack of evidence for the conspiracy is evidence for how good this conspiratorial cover-up is. Like if you point out, um, but that's crazy. How, how, how would it be possible that so many government agencies could conspire um, and uh, bring about 9-11 with um, Israel so that they could, um, you know, uh, uh, increase their pressure on the Middle East to gain oil or whatever. You know, I don't, I don't remember. I'm not fresh on my 9-11 conspiracy theories. Uh, but you go, that, that's a crazy, crazy idea. How do you think that so many people could be involved? And that just gets folded in in the conspiracy story to, yes, that's how high up and how pervasive and how powerful the conspirators are is they go all the way to the top and they're able to control so much so much so that it makes it they make it even make it look like they're not they're not doing uh, they're not engaged in conspiracy and they're hiding their tracks that's how powerful they are um the conspiracy explains away the motives for disbelief and criticism with their own belief system. The skeptics or the uh, seemingly errant data is part of the conspiracy itself. Um, you know, sometimes people will say about evolution, uh, it was concocted by, the idea was concocted by Satan to lure away the believers. Um, so, so the skepticism there is actually part of, built into the Bible view, uh, for example. Um, and also, this is now out of date. This is from a year or two ago. Um, but also this conspiratorial thinking, what some politicians have discovered is that they can use it by, um, they, they can, uh, conspiratorial thinking has so much traction in normal people's brains that a clever politician can use it to um, produce flack, to hide, um, create a bunch of noise in the environment to hide what they're really doing. Uh, it's oddly enough, that sounds like a conspiracy, but it's people using uh, conspiratorial suggestions because that'll take off and that helps give them cover to undermine the actual truth. Um, now I sound like a crazy conspiracy conspiracy theorist. Uh, okay, let's talk about invisible escape clauses. These are built in immunis this is built in immunization from skepticism, and this is the idea that the truth has been hidden from us. 
Um, so a psychic might say, the presence of skeptics in the room who are examining my psychic powers, they disrupt my psychokinetic powers, so I can't levitate this object when you're watching. Or um, somebody says, non-believers can't experience the miracles. I actually had somebody say to me, um, oh, well, the, the thing I'm talking about is only a miracle if you already believe in them. But somebody like you, since you don't believe, well, you won't believe in it. So it's sort of built in uh, immunization here that, that nobody who doesn't believe uh, will believe. Uh, but the people who do believe, then they do. Um, and that sort of you know, conveniently inoculates them. Um, and and s s likewise with this idea that God made the 10,000-year-old geological strata look like it's 13.7 billion years old just to test our faith. Um, so it's a built-in immunization from skepticism. Um, and James the Amazing, Amazing Randy, who just died recently actually, used to offer up a million dollars for anybody who could show uh, real proof of psychokinetic powers. Um, or psychic ability or paranormal phenomena. And the thing is, he would design a test and then you needed to demonstrate that you could levitate objects or bend spoons or, or divine water or whatever. And I'll give you a million dollars, he said. And inevitably, they wouldn't be able to produce the proof. And they'd say something like, oh, well, you're in the room and you're giving it bad juju and you're producing bad, bad, bad vibrations and I can't perform my psychic powers when somebody skeptical like you is around. Uh, so Bodger and Brackman are pointing out when a belief system stumbles upon and then incorporates uh, something like an invisible escape clause, it makes it more resilient and resistant to disproof and gives it legs and makes it propagate through the population, uh, which is absolutely right. We'd expect lots of those to develop and, and, and turn up. Okay, so they're taking an epidemiological uh, kind of approach here. Um, how does the development, uh, how do these resilient structures or features and belief systems develop? Um, so this, their central thesis then is beliefs that develop into systems which are more successful in withstanding empirical failures and surviving the onslaught of critical arguments will be more readily acquired, remembered, and selected among their competitors. It's a very straightforwardly evolutionary mimetic um, sort of thesis, the way I've described it. Over time, problems, when they pop up, will inspire solution modifications, reinterpretations, and elaborations, and you'll see the idea system mutate to try to deal with the new environment, and certain successful configurations will recur across different domains. Hence, we're talking about Alternative medicine, political conspiracies, religious beliefs, UFO cults, end of the world, um, you know, ideology. We're talking about all these different sort of weird beliefs, but we're seeing this at a high level, abstract level, the same kind of features kind of emerge. Um, and we're wondering, why are there so many people around me believing this manifestly crazy thing? Well, it's because the manifestly crazy thing is um, uh, a really viable organism that thrives in the hosts around it. And it's got very um, powerful features that enable it to persist, to resist, to, to be um, um, resistant to eradication. You can't get rid of this infection. Systems crystallize after successive modifications and elaborations attempting to rescue them from refutation. The ideology develops into a new form that works better. And like I've suggested before, I don't see how this is not an evolutionary mimetic account. It pretty clearly is, in my view. Um, I think the idea is that they think that, that uh, on their view, it's more responsive to the particular shape of human cognitive architecture. So that's fair enough. I think that's right. Okay, so lots of examples of people believing in Judgment Day. Um, I've just got some examples here. Uh, um, you know, people thinking that the end of the world's coming. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they talk about that in their article. Um, and people trying to reconcile themselves with this. this um, you know, Jesus had said um, that there are some of you in the room who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And the suggestion by lots of Christians has been, um, well, some people took that to mean that Jesus was saying that the uh, second coming or that the, the, heaven, the, the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God was going to come um, during our lifetime, 
meaning his and his disciples' lifetime. Then when it doesn't come, people are left to try to refigure and recalculate and figure out, well, what does that mean? And people said things like, oh, well, it was a spiritual revolution, not a political revolution. And there's a whole sort of backstory here in uh, Christian history that's really interesting. Um, lots of other examples of Judgment Day, people making predictions, and see what you should never do is put a date on it, um, but I've got lots of people who made dates, you know, coming in with our friend Harold Camping we talked about. So what's happening is that um, uh, there's these ideological mutations over time. Reinterpretations do not present themselves spontaneously, and they're not deliberately constructed by believers with strategic purposes in mind. So you might wonder, well, do these people really believe what they're saying, or is this just like a sinister way for a money-hungry preacher to keep the money coming into the church? Um, I wouldn't put that past some of these uh, preachers who've realized that there's a really good income to be had here, uh, tax-free. But I think Bodger and Brackman's idea is that the humans can be sort of none the wiser here. It's not as if there's a sinister motive here or evil. Um, um, intentional manipulation by one person of other people with the ideas. It's more like um, what happens is that these ideas mutate and develop through the population and some work and some don't. And f for whatever set of reasons, sinister or not, um, some features will emerge and those ones will catch on. Um, in the doomsday cult, a plausible post hoc rationalization of prophetic failure is typically suggested by the group leader who's got to say to his followers, well, why, you know, we all sold all our homes and our houses and, and our goods and we went and waited on a mountain for you and God didn't come. So what gives? Well, the leader's got to come up with a new idea, got to come up with a new date or do something. Um, so what happens is that solutions emerge over time that are cognitively optimal, and they get picked up by the other believers. Um, okay, so some of these variations have survival fitness uh, within the, the uh, environment, and where the environment is a bunch of human brains. Belief systems that have constructed elaborations or reinterpretations that make it impervious to empirical failure will survive the day on which the prophecy fails and live on in this more resistant form. Um, and then they get sort of widespread cultural dissemination. And the other ones that don't have those features, they wither away and they simply just don't make it anymore. Or their adherents kill themselves, like in the case of the UFO call I was talking about. Or I've been thinking about the QAnon case. You know, that was achieving really widespread belief before Trump left office. Um, lots of Americans were working themselves up and believing that Trump was about to do some, you know, major... Uh, military purges and kill all these evil Democrats. Okay, when it doesn't happen, what happens to the people who are left holding the bag, the people who believe? I think some people just kind of drop it. They just kind of move on. Or they, just, they get kind of disillusioned and they the people move on, but the idea lingers out there, sort of like a, like a virus sort of simmering in the background and it's waiting to kind of flare back up and leap back up into and start infecting more hosts. Um, nobody represents some of this Bodrian Brackman stuff better than Alex Jones, who's now been kind of pushed to the background. He's been pushed off of YouTube, um, and he's not nearly as big as he was a few years ago. But this passage just really fits what Alex Jones used to do. Still does, actually. He was, he was in the middle of some of this responses to the Capitol riots recently. Apparently, disconfirming evidence is interpreted as forged evidence and false information spread by the conspirators. Uh, there was a widespread view among QAnon believers um, in the few weeks between the certification of the Electoral College vote for Trump and then when Biden actually took office, um, and a bunch of QAnon people said that the Capitol rioters were actually Antifa liberals who were dressed as Trump supporters and went and did that to make it look like Trump supporters were rioting and ransacking the Capitol. But those weren't actually uh, Trump supporters doing that. They were our enemies dressed up to look like us, trying to make us look bad. Alex Jones is, a, is brilliant at generating these uh, inversions. Having been 
uh, bribed by the way uh, the government or bribed away by the government or having merely been misled by the cunning of the evil plotters. If a new piece of evidence turns up that seems to be in conflict with the conspiracy hypothesis or a new argument is vo voiced by critics, different ways of explaining away these difficulties may be tried out. And the ones that are most successful from a psychological perspective in virtue of their allowing beliefs, believers to preserve an illusion of objectivity are taken up by other members to become part of the belief system. Um, go listen to, but don't believe him, go listen to um, Alex Jones talking to Joe Rogan, and he can spin out these um, flipped accounts of crisis actors and false flags um, almost effortlessly. He's very adept at um, taking a piece of counter evidence and flipping it around to make it um, look like it's just the opposite of what we thought. Okay, so... Um, this is an epistemological um, or a cognitive approach. They say, um, sorry, this is an epistemological approach. Self-validating belief systems are generated by, on, on the human brain side, our proficiency for ad hoc reasoning and rationalization, our motivation to reduce cognitive dissonance, the persistence of confirmation bias, um, the premium that we place on being rational and free of bias or objective, um, and then also, they discuss this at some length, that conspiracy theories exploit another feature of our cognitive architecture, um, that we've got this hyperactive agency detection uh, uh, module in our brains. We're very prone to see faces. We're very, very prone to see agency in the world where it actually isn't. It's a good example of a high false positive um, error management problem in human cognitive systems, or our hazard pre precaution systems are overactive. You know, we're too worried about possible threats in our environment, um, and conspiracy theories uh, uh, capitalize on that. Um, we've our systems are built to oversee agents in the world, oversee purpose, see too much, um, uh, too many people, people where there are none, mind where there is none. And we're over. We're prone to see too many hazards, or or be um, overly cautious about possible threats. Well, you put those together, and man, that's just a recipe for for co for conspiracy theories to just explode in um, human social systems. So, uh, epidemiology in in medicine um, deals with the incidence, distribution, and possible control of diseases and other factors relating to health. Um, and you can see now how this uh, is an epidemiological approach to the way ideas spread. Um, and they address at a little length in the background about whether there's um, whether the people are sincere who say these things that they believe. Um, and we, I won't go into the sort of details on that just now. Um, okay, one thing that I think is missing from Beaudry and Brackman that I want to add is that many of these beliefs, belief systems build in um, public proclamation as an article of faith, a proof, the, proof, the proof of devotion. So one of the things that, like, in Christian systems you're supposed to do is you need to pu publicly proclaim your belief. You need to go down front and confess your sins in front of everybody, or you need to um, uh, attest to your belief, or you need to um, uh, testify to non-believers. Um, and when primates do that, when they do it out loud in front of other people, now you've got some ego and some social stuff that kicks in that makes them double down and makes them even more resistant to giving up the idea. Baudry, Baudry and Brackman don't talk about any of this um, empirical evidence at all. Um, and the public pro proclamation as a result, in turn, puts much more at stake for, at stake for the believers when contra evidence arises. Um, so these guys um, actually uh, routinely um, march uh, up and down the street downtown in uh, Sacramento on J Street. Okay, so, so and I've got a bunch of pictures of other guys doing the same thing. So now once you've done that, once you've gotten so much Jesus in your heart that you need to make a sign and you really feel the um, urgency of spreading the word, and so much so that you'll get out there on a street corner and march around with a sign. Okay, once you've done that, well, there's no going back from that shit, right? You can't back down now. There's no way if you start to have doubts or if contrary evidence comes up or something bad happens or you, you get some question in your mind about your Bible study or your preacher or whoever, well, what the fuck do you do now that you've been marching on the street sign, street corner with that sign? Like, you can't return from that. 
Um, so it's a kind of a ratcheting that gets you in the zone. And now that guy's going to be out there. He's going to double down. He's not going to give that up. Bodrum and Brackman don't talk about any of those sorts of social features at all. And I think that's a, that's a, a real missing feature, missing um, element here. So um, I, I'm calling that doubling down. There's a, there's a psych literature on entrenchment. Um, or this sort of blowback effect, or tribalism, obviously, where people, um, you know, are bonding together um, and doing this thing together that they can't now uh, back off from. Okay, so in conclusion, pseudoscience and other forms of weird belief systems are not inherently fragile, say Bodrian Brackman. They're resilient against contrary evidence and criticism. This invulnerability helps explain their persistence and popularity. Belief systems that allow the believer to remain outside the reach of refutation or that provide some convenient ways of coping with difficulties will be more likely to be selected among competing beliefs and belief systems and more likely to be dis disseminated. So here we are at the culmination of thousands of years of sort of social mimetic evolution, and we would expect to find in our midst, in this environment, lots of these resilient, persistent, weird belief systems that just can't be eradicated. You can't disprove them with contrary evidence because the ones that have survived to, to, to be around us now to infect your brother-in-law or to you know, propagate through your preacher or whatever, those ideas are very well suited, well adapted to making it in the world. So then what happens is that on the, on the cognitive psychology side, human cognitive systems that have all of those proclivities in the red box confirmation bias, rationalization, and so on. Um, over time, what happens then is that belief systems that develop self-validating features, defense me mechanisms, and immunization strategies that exploit those features in human cognitive systems, those will emerge. And then, as a result, over time, human populations will be full of crazy belief systems that are resilient, difficult to eradicate, adaptive, invasive, persistent, ductile. They're vigorous. They're very healthy, right? They really make it. All right. So that's my sort of best, clearest, uh, uh, believe it or not, short uh, explanation of uh, Baudry and Brackman's analysis of how weird belief systems um, take on a life of their own and survive in populations.